Welcome to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Colossians 2, if you missed Wednesday night, I'm going to try to help catch you up a little bit. But I encourage you to always go back in any messages that you may have missed. Again, so my question to you today is, if I could bring to you today a teaching, a simple truth of a teaching today about how to get your faith to abound, would you be interested? Yes. Now, if you don't want abounding faith, then you can ignore what I'm going to teach on today. But abounding faith means literally you got more than what you need. So you got more than enough. You got the ability to walk in what God has for your life. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. Why does faith please God? Because faith causes us to walk in what he has available for your life. Imagine a parent raising a child, preparing what they obviously could do to help provide for their future, but then the parent, uh, excuse me, then the child doesn't take advantage of what the parent prepared. How heartbroken that parent would be to know that I prepared all this for my child to help them towards their future, whatever that may be, money for education, whatever, and they just didn't want to take advantage of it and walk in it. Well, think about God and all he's provided for us. Think about God through Christ Jesus. Uh, The Bible says that we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. But how do we walk in it? Through a walk of faith. We now walk by faith, not by sight. That is something that we all learn. Walking by faith is not earning anything from God. Walking by faith is learning how to receive what we now have available. None of us really truly walked in a faith walk towards God before being born again. We didn't know how. We didn't even know God to do so. But once we get born again, thank God we can. I said, thank God we can. And in Colossians chapter 2, this is what this is being uh, spoken of here and referring to the salvation we receive and how we should walk after receiving it. So he tells us this very clearly. Colossians chapter 2, and as you're going to see today, of course, as we're talking about this weekend of Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving, you're going to see how it ties to a, a grateful heart, gratitude. Colossians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul by the Holy Spirit said here, For though I'm absent in the flesh, in other words, he wasn't with them, of course, at the time, writing this letter to them, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order, And the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now the good order he talks about here is the order within the church. God does all things decently and in order. So even in relationship to church, not a religious system, but there has to be a design of order within the church. Leadership, proper things, the way things are done, etc. That we don't just let anybody come in the sanctuary and into the church to do what they want. God wants order in the church so everybody gets blessed, everybody gets helped, and God's will gets fulfilled. So he says, I'm rejoicing to see your good order, but also I'm rejoicing to see what? The steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now, a steadfastness of faith in Christ means you did more than just got born again. You are consistently day in, day out, living a life of faith. Now, if you're doing that, you're seeing results. You're seeing results. So as believers, thank God we can walk in a walk of faith with God and experience a day in and day out walking through this life of overcoming victory. Doesn't mean you don't face challenges, but you overcome them all. There should not be a challenge that ever overcomes you as a believer because no such thing overcame Jesus. Jesus, as we sang about today, has given us victory, right? And then we receive our victory by faith, by understanding what the blood of of the Lamb did for us, and we testify by faith what that has done. So he goes on to say in verse 6, now watch this. So verse 5 is talking about the fact he was excited to get to see them again, looking to see the order of what was you know, taking place within the church and the steadfastness of their faith in Christ since they had been born again. Look at this, verse 6. As you, this is the verse, this and 7 is what, what I want you to focus on. Verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Stop. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? Well, if you haven't, you can do that today. Because receiving him, notice the phrase, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. 
So let me slow down just a little bit. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord. How do you get born again? You have to make him your Lord. That's what Romans 10, 13 says. All who call upon the name of the Lord. What does it mean to call upon the name, the name of the Lord? Am I just saying, okay, I just declare your name so I'm saved? No, no. To call upon the name of the Lord means you call upon him to be your Lord. To make him the Lord. What's Lord mean? Supreme in authority. I don't want to be supreme in authority. If I remain supreme in authority, I remain in life without God. I remain as a sinner who needs salvation, who has had broken relationship with the Father because of sin. But if I will make him the Lord of my life, accepting his lordship over my life, then guess what I receive? Salvation. And the ability to now walk in that lordship of what he provides. So he says clearly, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. So again, let me stop again. If I've received him as Lord of my life, how did I do that? Did I work to earn it? Did I go to so many church services to prove that, that, that he was the Lord of my life? No. Did I, quote unquote, read so many scriptures to prove that? No. Nope. Did I prove it by so many hours in prayer? No. Nope. How did I do it? Childlike faith, John three sixteen. right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why did he give him? Because the world was in need of salvation. The world was in sin. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe in him, whoever what believes in him, believes, shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. God doesn't want anybody to perish. The word perish means separated from him for all eternity. So realize nobody on this planet living now is going to end living. Want to get that across? Oh, sure they will. No, they won't. Every person is a spirit. You're not a body. Your body's an earth suit. We've taught you this many times. The Bible's explicitly clear on it. I'm not a body. I'm a spirit. And your spirit's going to go somewhere when this body stops functioning. Or the Lord comes and gets us. You want a little side note, a little, little rabbit trail. You want more proof that you're in the last of the last days? Biblical proof from Jesus' own lips? I'll prove it to you. Jesus said, I'm going to come at an hour talking to the church. I'm going to come at an hour you don't know. Now, if the church really believed Jesus was coming any day, those who claim Jesus are born again, if the church was truly walking in a light of understanding he could come today, how many think would be missing church today? Now, I'm not saying church gets you to heaven, but they'd have such a passion and love for God, they'd want to be around the things of God any, any chance they could get. Right? Now, I understand. I'm not saying some might obviously be going on a vacation with their family. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about people just sitting home doing other, something else, watching football today or whatever. You listening? So I want you to understand this. It's evidence that he is even closer to coming than ever before because he said when that day comes, all the prophecies that need to be fulfilled in relationship to his return have been fulfilled. And then he said, I'm going to come at a time you don't expect. Church really doesn't expect him to show up because if they did, I guarantee you, most Christians would be living a whole lot different life. They'd be trying to win everybody they could to Jesus to get him ready for his return. But notice again, so off, off pause, back to this. As you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, back on pause, how did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? How did you do that? By faith. By faith. I believe, John three sixteen. He who believes, right, shall be saved. Saved from what? Damnation. Saved from the old sin nature. You won't perish. Eternal life. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Because I called upon him, believed in the fact that he died for me. Therefore, I called upon him to do what he said, make him my Lord. And by putting my faith in him and releasing my faith in him, a miracle happened. Amen. And I got born again. Right. How did I do that? You didn't earn it. No. You didn't get it by church attendance. Right. So no, going to church doesn't get you saved. But once you're born again, you should love God's house like Jesus did. A lot of people complain about going to church today because of all the people that's in church that are hypocrites. Let me help you. You're probably the worst one if you don't go to church. <laughs> Jesus went to church. <laughs> Luke tells you that. Luke chapter 4 says, as his custom, his routine, his habit was, in their day church was on a Saturday, he was in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now, can I help you? Have anybody had an excuse not to go to church? It was Jesus. That's true. You want to know why? They wanted to kill him. These people wanted to kill him. And they made it very aware, very well, well known. His very first sermon he preached, you kidding me? What did they do after he preached his first sermon? 
they grabbed him. They took him out to the edge of a cliff and tried to throw him off an edge of a cliff. That didn't stop him from going back to church. Thank you for all your amends about that. So as you receive Christ Jesus as the Lord, how'd you do that? By faith. By just simply putting your trust and faith in him. Watch this. I'll pause. Now watch. So walk in him. Walk in who? What's that mean? You're going to get to walk in the same kind of life Jesus walked in. If you will learn to continue this walk the same way you got born again. If you walk in this life of which you got born again the same way you got saved, walking by faith, not by sight, you're going to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. See, a lot of people try to walk in the footsteps of Jesus by outward conformity to what Jesus did. No, it's by inward faith in the Word of God. It's by inward trust in the Word of God. If I walk by trust in the Word of God, yeah, I'm going to honor and walk out the light of the Word, but not to try to prove anything to God because He obviously said, that's what I'm to do. He's given me the faith to do it. As we've just confessed, I not only believe I am who He says I am, I have what He says I have, but I can do what He says I can do. So how do you walk in Him? The same way you got born again. Verse 7. So here you go. You ready? You ready? Watch this. Rooted and built up in Him. So if I'm walking in the same way that I got born again, what's the whole context here? A faith walk. It's all about a faith walk. He said, I'm looking forward to seeing whether you have the steadfastness of faith. You receive Jesus by faith. You walk in him by faith. Seven. How? Rooted. Rooted. And built up in who? Rooted and built up in him. One. And two. Established in the faith. Watch this. As you have been taught. So he had taught them this. How do you get established in a life of faith? Watch this. Abounding in it with thanksgiving. Wow. Abounding in what? A faith walk. In other words, your faith will abound if you you choose to learn to live a life of thanksgiving or the same term which would be gratitude or grateful. So grateful people say it. Come on, say it with me. Grateful people are what? They're faithful. Now, I, I typed it this way on purpose. With the F-U-L-L, not F-U-L, so well, you didn't check your spelling. No, I typed it that way on purpose because to be grateful means I'm full, full. of gratitude. Yes. Right. I don't have a little. No. I'm full of gratitude. If I'm full of gratitude, as I'm about to show you, what's that going to cause my faith to do? Abound. Yeah. So I'm going to be faithful or what? Full of faith. I'm not going to be lacking in faith. No. How many would make sure, how many would like to make sure in your life you're not lacking in faith? Yeah. So <clears throat> what do we do? To see this happen, we have to learn to cultivate a life of thanksgiving. Now, he gave you two keys here in verse 7. Our focus in this series is the thanksgiving part. But let me just go back and read it one more time. He says again that he wants to see them established in this walk of faith as he had taught them how. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him. So clearly this isn't going to happen without a dedicated relationship with Jesus. To be rooted and built up in Jesus means I'm walking with the Lord. I spend time with him every day. I fellowship with him every day. I talk to God. And that's what prayer is really all about, just talking to God. I have times that I spend time devoted to prayer and just talking to God throughout the day. I have time in the word with him. I fellowship with him and get to know him. Easiest way to get to know him is through his word. Easiest way. So if I'm not rooted and built up in him, how strong of a faith do you think you're going to have? Not much. I'm going to explain why. How in the world, if I, faith, another word for faith is what? I've told you this many times. Trust. Trust. How in the world could I trust Josh Grimes to do anything that I asked Josh Grimes to do if I don't know Josh Grimes? Right. I mean, seriously, if I was going to entrust him with something pretty major in my life to be able to do something for me that would be a major thing for me to turn over to him, would I actually be able to just do that with absolute trust if I didn't know him? You're going to walk up to the, so I know some of you might be tempted to do this with your kids. Don't do this. Uh, But, you know, you walk up to a stranger somewhere in a mall or something, don't even know him, and say, how would you like to handle my kid for a day? How would you like to just take my kid off my hands? (laughs) No, don't go there. (laughs) I know some of you think. (laughs) If you love your children, guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to trust that child to somebody you don't know. And if you don't know, why would you not do that? How could you trust somebody you don't know? One of the biggest reasons Christians have a struggle walking in a trust or a faith in God, they don't know him. 
They don't know him. So there's two things here. Say two things. How many want your faith to abound? How many want to see your, your trust in God just, I mean, just, just explode, man. Just go to heights and levels you've never had it go to before. You got to do two things. One, you got to have a relationship with him. You got to be rooted and built up in him. Because if you don't know him, how are you going to put trust in this God who you don't know? How are you going to do that? Number two, you ready? You got to live a life of gratitude. He said it. He said, you're going to have to be rooted and built up in him. And the way you're going to abound in this faith as well is through thanksgiving. Now, this is a challenge even in my life. Seriously, you're not thankful to God? Oh, I am. But it's easy to allow circumstances in life every day to rob you of this gratitude. So all you're doing is complaining, moaning, groaning. I know this doesn't apply to any of you probably in this room. So I'm just reinforcing probably what you're already walking in. But you probably never moan or groan about lines. At the grocery store, traffic that you drive through, things that you ordered didn't show up on time. I, see, none of you do this, I know. None of you do this, right? Or you complained about the spouse you prayed for and you now have. <laughs> Woo! We might have to do some marriage counseling after, the, after this mess. Or you complain about the place that you now have to live in, but you prayed for God, prayed for God to bless you with a nice place, and He did. Now I got all this stuff to take care of. Yeah. So you complain about all the time, but you have no time to do it. Mercy. Folks, I'm going to tell you what. In, in relationship to life, it is so easy to live a life of ingratitude. Yes. And Satan wants you to because guess what? He knows it's going to rob your faith in God. But it robs more than your faith. Without faith, you have no peace. Without faith, you have no joy. I'm talking about faith in God. How in the world could the Apostle Paul, I've shared this with you many times, New Testament, think of all that Paul went through in his life. You know, I I saw this, sadly. I'm not going to use the name because I'm not a slanderer. I saw this from a very, very famous minister's wife who said, God wants you to be happy. You just do today whatever makes you happy. Are you kidding me? You're you're a major ministry, and you're standing up telling all the world, God just wants you to be happy. You just do whatever makes you happy. Well, guess what? You might find out some crazy things. Make people happy. Now, I got a word for you. Paul didn't wake up every day and say, Now, Lord, I'm just going to do what makes me happy today. So, uh, you know, I got arrested the other day. I'm not preaching the gospel anymore. That don't make me happy to get arrested. And remember just a few weeks back, Lord, when I was preaching in that other place and they stoned me and left me for dead? Now, I'm done with that. Now, I'm not doing this gospel thing anymore. I'm not, I'm not walking out this gospel call on my life to preach the gospel anymore because it don't make me very happy. Getting stoned and left for dead, that don't make anybody very happy. Getting beaten with rods, nah, that don't make people very happy. Getting shipwrecked overnight in the deep, nah, that don't make people very happy. Come on, somebody. Getting locked up in a prison, you know, in a dungeon, that don't make people very happy. But you know what they were doing down there? They were singing. They were worshiping. What did their faith do? Cause God to respond. See, the thing that you and I got to understand is gratitude has everything to do with what you focus on in life. Everything. So see this again. Now this is powerful. If you want to see your faith grow, one of the key elements, one of the key elements that we don't talk enough about, and I honestly don't talk enough uh, enough about relating to your faith abounding, is this thing called gratitude or thanksgiving. So how many want to learn a little more about it today? I want you to go with me, if you would, please, to the book of Romans chapter 4. We looked at it the other night, but I want to show you again real quick. We're just going to cut to the chase. I'm not going to read all the verses we read. We can't reread everything that we did in a previous service, but this is a key thing I want you to see about this. How in the world, pastor, does gratitude or giving thanks build faith? Let's find out. He said it does, so we know it does. Number one, already I know because of Colossians chapter 2 verse 7, thanksgiving clearly will make my faith abound. Why? He said so. He said so. Do we have proof that that's actually true? Yeah, we do. All through the Bible. Let's look at one. That's a direct relationship to this. We can pick up on our father Abraham, who was a man of faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 19. Remember, he was given a promise back in verse 13 that he would be what? Heir of the world. Heir of the world. That he would inherit the ability... To walk in the blessing of what this earth has to offer that God provided. How many know he was a very wealthy man? And he would do so also by what? Having all these descendants, which you're a part of. 
So it says here in verse 19, after God gave him this promise, notice this, not being weak in faith. Well, if he wasn't weak in faith, that means he was what? Strong in faith. Can you be weak in faith? You can. Can you be strong in faith? Obviously you can. He was not weak in faith, watch this, because notice, he did not do what? Did not consider his own body. So faith doesn't look at the circumstances. And you want to know why Thanksgiving goes hand in hand with building faith and the fact that it causes you to not look at the circumstances? Because your focus is on God. Amen. You're not going to walk in gratitude in Thanksgiving if your focus is on the circumstances. You got to get your focus on God. So he says clearly in this relationship to Abraham, Paul said, he was not weak in faith and did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Given a promise to have this child of which in the natural it looked impossible. But he was not what? He was not weak in faith. 20, he did not waver therefore. See, a lot of Christians waver. I have a question for you. I'll raise my hand first. You ever prayed a prayer of faith, released your faith, and then wavered? Yep. yep. But, but he didn't. Remember what he said about the Colossians? I'm excited to see the steadfastness. You don't waver. Amen. Too many Christians are wavering faith Christians. Gratitude helps you get rid of that. So notice this. He didn't waver at the promise of God through what? Unbelief. Unbelief. But he was what? Tell me. Tell me out loud, please. Wow, here's a nugget. Here's a key how to strengthen your faith. How was he strengthened in faith? Giving glory to God. 21, being fully convinced. Say fully convinced. That what he God had promised, he was also able to do what? How would you like to walk through this life having an absolute, without a doubt, a, 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 a spirit, fully convinced that whatever God has said, I know is mine. I know it's done. Well, Abraham gives us a clue here that ties back to what we talked about in Colossians 2, 7 about gratitude, thanksgiving. He didn't waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was what? Strengthened in faith. Now, one version says his faith grew stronger. That would be abounding. I said that would be abounding. His faith grew stronger as he began to praise and thank and glorify and magnify his God. See, giving glory to God is focusing on God and therefore magnifying him. We read it uh, Wednesday night. I don't have time to go back there in the Psalms. Thanksgiving glorifies God. So gratitude, thanksgiving, and glorifying God all go hand in hand. They're all the same thing. If I'm glorifying God, guess what I'm doing? I'm acknowledging him. And therefore, I'm clearly grateful if I'm acknowledging him for who he is and for what he's done. So how did Abraham see his faith grow stronger? I'll tell you how. Gratitude. Gratitude. Thanksgiving. He got to know God, number one, right? God took him out to the desert. He began to develop a relationship with him. He got to know God. Number two, he learned to not moan and groan. How many know he could have moaned and groaned about being out there in the desert with God? You're taking me away from my family. You're taking me away from all the security that I have. You're taking me out here in the wilderness. Okay, ladies. Guess what? Your honey's coming home today and say, darling, I bought a tent. See, y'all excited. I got women going, uh-uh. But you know what Abram did one day? He showed up at home and said, hey, honey, we're leaving here. We're leaving our home. We're leaving all of our families. We're leaving all of this surrounding area. And you know where we're going? We ain't going to Honolulu. We ain't going to the beach. We're going to the desert. You listening? And we're going to live in a tent. Now, how in the world could Abram put such faith in God? Because one, he got to know him. And two, he truly was grateful for the fact that God would have anything to do with him. That God would want me to know him and give me that opportunity, the God of all the universe. See, it wasn't about stuff for Abram. It wasn't about what he had. It was about the relationship he gained. How many Christians are grateful for their relationship for God today? Evidently not a whole lot because they don't seem to want to spend much time with him. But Abram did. I said Abram did. He didn't care about the wilderness. He didn't care about what he had or didn't have. And how many know he became a very wealthy man? He got a lot of stuff. 
I said, he got a lot of stuff. So much him and Lot had to separate. They didn't, but they did separate. But that shouldn't have never happened. So again, notice this. How did he become so strong in faith, Pastor? Well, one of the ways was he was doing what? Giving glory to God. Say he was grateful. What was he grateful for? Relationship. God would give me this relationship. The phrase here, give glory in the Greek language, says to magnify, to honor, and to exalt through praise. To magnify, to honor, and to exalt through praise. How many understand this? I want to say it again. To magnify, say that. To honor, say that. To exalt through praise. You know what happens in the throne room every single time the angels circle and see God's face? They're doing this right here. You know why? They see him. You know what? None of us are going to have a problem doing when we get to heaven. They're exercising gratitude. Glorifying. You know what? You're going to see him. Well, until I can see him. Oh, but you can. You can see him through the eye of faith. Just like Abram did. You can begin to see how good your God is. See, when you start honoring God with gratitude, what are you doing according to the Psalms again? You're magnifying God. And the more you can get grateful to God and all that he's done, guess what? The bigger he becomes, the smaller your problems look. The smaller the things of this life look. The more I walk with God, the less I could care less about having anything this world has to offer. I want everything God has to offer. And the relationship is the most valuable thing above all. So clearly, Abram proved here that faith can be increased and strengthened, again, by simply doing what? Giving glory to God. Or, in other words, again, as I just said a minute ago, doing what? Showing gratitude. Showing gratitude. Now, I want you to go with me, if you would, please, to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. So what we've got to learn to do, and I'm going to show you more in relationship of how to do this tonight, because you can't get this all in one message. What we've got to learn to do if we want, if, 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 if we want our faith to abound, if we want our trust in God to be stronger than it's ever been, to know that no matter what happens, I mean, sadly, I've I've mentioned it just for the fact of an example to simply say, here's a modern day event and look how it affected most Christians. Look what happened when COVID hit. Look how many Christians were scared to death to leave their homes. They didn't have to be told to stay inside. They didn't want to get out. They were scared to death about this virus that came. Well, it was a killer virus. Man, there's been killer viruses before. It ain't new. Number one, coronavirus has been around forever. Number two, there's been other killer viruses as well, right? Think about how many people fear the word cancer. See, you and I have not been given a spirit of fear. Spirit. Spirit of fear. But a power of love and a sound mind. You know what happens when you get in fear? You lose a sound mind. You don't even think from a perspective of basic common sense. You don't even think in a way with common sense anymore. Fear just begins to take over. The sad part about it is Satan gets a lot of Christians in fear with stuff that never even happens. But if you allow that fear to come in and you start walking in fear, it can open the door for it to happen. But thank God you and I can walk in an abounding faith. And if we walk in an abounding faith, just like Abram, when God says, leave your family, go to the wilderness, you're not looking downward at, hey, this is horrible. Why is he calling me? Why do I got to go out there? And Why do we got to live in a tent? No, you're like, you know what the side you're looking at? I get to walk with God. Amen. You kidding me? God's going to sit there and visit with me day in and day out. I'm going to get to know the God of the universe. Where do you want me to go, man? Tell me where you want me to be and I'm there. Amen. Amen. Now, God doesn't have to pull you out in the sense into a natural wilderness all the time to do that. But there is an implication that we need to understand. What was he pulling him away from? Everything that would have hindered that. His natural family that could have hindered that. I'm not saying that all of us should have nothing to do with our families. We should honor moms and dads. We should love our families. But you know what? Natural families can hinder you in ways too. So you got to realize in relationship to walking in trust, what do you also need to recognize the significance of if you want to walk in gratitude? Who do you hang with? Because if you listen to ungrateful people all the time, that's going to get on you. If that's all you're hearing all the time, that's going to start affecting how you act. You listening? I mean, come on, it don't take long. Two people standing around start talking, and all of a sudden, it turns from anything positive to all the negative that's going on in the world. And when one starts it, guess what? The other one chimes in. Been there, done that. 
Can't even tell you how many times that I've been in conversation with somebody and all of a sudden they bring up one negative thing and guess what? It automatically spurs in my old flesh. (laughs) To respond to that, something else negative. Yeah, did you know about this? And did you hear about that? And isn't this horrible? Well, that's not going to help you walk in faith with God. How about talking about how big your God is? How about when a problem comes up, you don't magnify the problem and talk more about the problem, but you start talking about the very promise that God gave you to overcome the problem. Because every time a problem rises up, you know what you can say? And it's just another opportunity for my God to just prove how big he is. Can I get a better amen? amen? But most Christians don't respond that way. They talk more of the problem. And all this leads to is what the children of Israel did, moaning, groaning, and complaining. So we talked a little bit about the children of Israel in relationship to what they walked in. We're going to see another verse to talk about that in a minute. But before we do, look at Hebrews 13. So in Hebrews chapter 13, you're still with me, aren't you? Pick it up with me in verse 10, please. Verse 10 of Hebrews 13. We have an altar talking about New Testament believers. Just, I'll have to take a time to go read all the verses here. You can look at it yourself later. But it's relating to the fact that he's referring now to New Testament believers, those who are born again, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. So the reference here is to those of the Old Testament who are still living under the way of the law even though Jesus had come and died. The altar here referring to the ways of the Old Testament laws established for a purpose until Jesus would come. To cover their sin. We now have an altar though. Not a natural one like they're going. And actually you know, pouring blood on. We have an altar to partake of. Of which those who are still caught up under this old legalistic. Uh, old, old Testament law system. They don't have a right to eat. Why? They haven't put their faith in Jesus. Right. What are we talking about? Abounding in faith. Abounding. Right? Mm-hmm. Not abounding in some religious system. Abounding in our trust in God. Well, what are these people that he's talking about still doing? They're still putting their trust in a religious system. This is why they reject Christ. This is why they reject what Jesus has to offer and what he's trying to help them walk out. And why many of the Jews still didn't believe he was the Messiah. They didn't believe he was the Son of God. They acknowledged, okay, good prophet, yeah. We can't deny the miracles he did because they knew even prophets of the Old Testament did, a, did miracles. So we can't deny the miracles he did. Son of God, nah, this couldn't have been the Son of God. Well, why were they thinking that? When they saw the very fulfillment of all the prophecies they knew about Jesus come to pass. Because they're still serving an old religious system. They're still offering sacrifices and all aspects of what they do in the natural to try to make themselves right with God and to see God work on their behalf. Verse 11, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin... Now, that's a key phrase because there was multiple sacrifices they had to offer, one of which was for the offering of sin. If you don't know this, the offering of sin required that they took the animal of which they were to offer for sin, and after they had actually, they took the animal outside the camp, outside where they actually coincided with the tabernacle, they had to take him out outside the camp, basically in the wilderness, kill the animal, bring the blood back to give to the priest to offer for their sin. But, the, but that body, that animal was totally burned. They couldn't have anything to do with it. Acknowledging the fact that God, by the blood that they were actually bringing to the priest, would oversee their sin or cover their sin. But under the New Testament, guess what we do? We still offer up a sacrifice of praise, as you're about to see, but we don't have to bring, quote unquote, our bodies to God anymore to try to prove something to God that we deserve what God has to offer us. Amen. No, it's by faith and trust in him alone. Yes. Can I get a better amen? Yes. So the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, say, set us apart, <clears throat> that he might sanctify the people to who? To God. Notice, with his, notice his own blood suffered outside the gate. He too, outside the gate of the city, suffered and died so that his blood could be shed so that we could come into the very inner court with God and have fellowship with him. 13, therefore, let us do what? Because of this, let us go forth to him, to Jesus. Let us go receive the sacrifice he offered, the sacrifice he made that we don't have to make anymore, talking about the relationship 
to us of what we do religiously through exercises of natural means. No, by faith in the blood of Jesus. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Meaning what? We're coming outside of the Old Testament religious system, and we're now putting our faith in Jesus. So that's all those verses said right there. 14, notice, for here in this lifetime, in this earth where we're living, we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. How many are ready for that? Yes. little side note, by the way, that, that new city to come is called the New Jerusalem. Yes. Now, I understand because I've, I've done this. For, you know, A lot of times ministers will say this. If you, don't, if you don't agree with this statement, just go read it for yourself. It's not anything to get hung up over. People want to major on the minors, Right? Well, we're the bride of Christ. No, the Bible says in the New Testament, we're the friends of the bridegroom. Amen. Who's the bride? Well, go read Revelation. John represents the church there in the book of Revelation. And the angel said, come, I'll show you the bride. Right. And he takes him and he shows, and guess what he sees? The new Jerusalem. He said, there's the bride. Right. We're the friends. Yeah. I said, we're the friends. Yeah. We get to rejoice and celebrate with the, with the, yeah. with the uh, bridegroom, Jesus. Yes. But that's what the Bible says. I like what the Bible says. How about you? Yeah. Notice here, so we, verse 14, have no continuing city here. We seek the one to come. How many are you seeking that one to come? Yeah. 15. Here's the key is what I want to get to. Therefore, by him, by Jesus, not by what we do in the natural, not by our personal effort of, of natural sacrifices that we think we're making for God. No. By him, by his sacrifice, let us do what? Continually offer. Continually offer what? The sacrifice of praise. Yes. So what are we to offer? Gratitude. Yes. Gratitude. See, if we offer gratitude, we're not doing anything that we do in relationship to our walk with God to try to get something from God. We actually simply do what? Give praise and thanks to God and therefore walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. We're not trying to earn anything, in other words. Yeah. Through some form of a sacrifice. How many of the Bible says God doesn't desire your sacrifice but your loyalty? He doesn't want you living this life like you're giving a sacrifice for God. So Jesus was that sacrifice. Aren't you glad? That's, that's what he's saying. Therefore, by him, by Jesus, his sacrifice, what are we New Testament Christians supposed to do? Continually. Say continually. How many think that would probably be a daily thing? Continually offer what? The sacrifice of praise to God. That is, and then he tells you what it is. The fruit of our lips doing what? Excuse me? Giving thanks to what? His name. Acknowledging what he has done. Name referring to acknowledging him, what he's done. He's the Lord of all. So how in the world do I now live my life of gratitude, offering to God this continual sacrifice of praise? With your mouth. The fruit of your lips means what you speak. What are you speaking day in and day out? Why is God telling you this? He wants your faith to abound. Colossians 2, 7, he wants your faith to abound. So he says, we now offer the sacrifice of praise, meaning we don't bring a bodily sacrifice. You listening? We bring a heart sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise to our God. And when we do that, guess what we begin to do? We begin to abound in faith, trust in God, and God begins to move on our behalf. Amen. So realize a lot of people still, is obedience to what Scripture teaches us important? Sure it is. Yeah, sure it is. But we're not doing it to earn anything from God. Obedience means we're learning how to live the kind of life He wants us to live that He provided. And just like Hebrews 11 says, all these people who were, quote-unquote, those who walk by faith, how did they walk by faith? Noah, build an ark. So how did Noah walk by faith with God? He built an ark. Why did he build an ark? Not because he was trying to earn anything from God. He had no idea what this thing was going to happen. This flood thing, you know, you know the after story. He don't picture all that. He's never seen a flood before. So why is he building a boat? God said to you. Now, is that the only reason? No, because he trusts in God. Trusts in God. So he chooses to honor God, trust God, does what God says. So he did it what? Not out of a sacrifice. Noah didn't build that boat as a sacrifice. I got to sacrifice my time and my effort and my life and my energy and my strength and build this boat for God. No, he didn't do it for that reason. He did it because he loved God and he trusted him. So what you're doing in life, is it based on a trust or faith in God or is it based on some form of sacrifice? If you come to church, you come because you love God, you're in 
Trust with, you're trusting God and faith with God, or you're doing it because it's some form of a, of a religious sacrifice. So we're to continually, say continually. Amen. We're to continually offer up what? The sacrifice of praise to God. What sacrifice do we give? Not a bodily sacrifice. A sacrifice from the heart of gratitude and praise to God. That's our sacrifice now. I'd like to add in here, it is a sacrifice. Meaning what? Well, you have to sacrifice your flesh to do it. Because you know what your flesh don't want to do? It don't want to give thanks to God. Not in times of hardship. Not in times of challenge. Not when people are treating you wrong. When people treat you wrong, you just have an automatic response. Isn't God good? I just love God. He's so great. Praise God for all that he's done in my life. So thankful that he loves me. I'm so thankful that I truly know him and I can walk with him every day. Praise the Lord. No, you're striking back at the person that's striking at you. You listening? But I guarantee you what, that's going to get you out of love. And getting you out of love will cause your faith not to operate. So gratitude ties back also to the love of God rising in our hearts, which causes our faith to abound in work. So I have to recognize every day, am I walking in gratitude or not? Because this is now my responsibility as a New Testament believer to continually offer up to God the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of my lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, we don't thank him, and I won't have time to go on this this morning. I'll touch on it tonight. We don't thank him for all the problems and all the challenges that come. Thank you, God, for letting me go through this horrible challenge, this horrible problem, this horrible deal. No, God doesn't bring that which still kills and destroys. Are you listening? Yeah. The Bible's clear. John 10, 10. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. That don't mean you're not going to face the enemy who's trying to still kill and destroy. Isn't that right? Yeah. But if you understand, that's not what God brings. God brings life and that more abundantly. How do you get it? By faith. Amen. By trusting God. And if my, if my faith or trust abounds, I get to walk in the abundant life that he has available. But it's up to me. How do I do that? How do I cultivate that? One of the ways I cultivate my faith is through what? Thanksgiving. So how grateful are you to God? How often do you voice your gratitude to God? Just for the fact, like Abram, you get to know him and walk with him. Abram wasn't out there thanking God for all the desert rats and all the, all the lizards and all the snakes and all that. And then, it's wonderful, God, that you brought me out here to play with all these snakes and all these rats and all these lizards and all this kind of stuff. It's wonderful that I get to sit out here and just have the dust blow through my tent every day and get everything dusty and dirty, you know, and praise God. It's just wonderful. No. What was he thanking God for? I get to walk with you. Amen. I get to know you. How grateful we should be. What Abram was grateful for, you and I should be even higher to a degree of gratitude because God's now living in you. He's now, he's now with you every day, everywhere you go. Can I get a better amen? So again, he said, clearly, we're to continually offer now up this sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of our lips doing what? Giving thanks to his name. Go to Psalm 78 in closing this morning. Psalm 78. So let's go back to the reference of the children of Israel that came out of Egypt. Now, if you just stop for a minute, I mean, if you know any of this story at all, how many, how many ever saw the movie? Was it, ben, was it called Ben-Hur? What was the movie? Ben -Hur. No, 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 no. What was the movie? Uh, Ten Commandments movie. Ten Commandments. Well, there you go. Where you see the children of Israel come out of Egypt. A lot, of what was per, a lot of what was spoken of in the Bible was clearly portrayed in the movie. Think of in the relationship to them being under bondage to Egypt, a type of the world. Here they're crying out to God to do what? Get out of that bondage. Right? We're tired of being under the oppressive work of Pharaoh. We're trying to, tired of being his slaves. Well, guess what? That was me and you to sin and to Satan. We're tired of this. We want free. And guess what God does? He responds and frees them. But before he does... Guess what he does? He literally shows all these mighty miracles by what he did in relationship to Pharaoh and to those in Egypt who were evil and didn't want to let him go. Time and time again, you see plague after plague after plague of a form of judgment of what God did to show them that he was to let them go. And I mean, the children of Israel sat there and witnessed all of that. And then above all, not to mention that, not only before they left, did all the people of Egypt come with all of this wealth and say, here... Take this. Just get out of here. Just leave. Now, why did God have them take that? I'll tell you why. Because they were going to need provision while they were out there in the wilderness to be able to do what? Eventually build a tabernacle. 
So literally, not only did they see that, but what was the greatest thing they saw above all that we just got done talking about? They saw the death angel pass them by. Everybody else who did not partake of taking a lamb, eating all of it, roasting it in fire, putting the blood over the doorpost, and get in that home. Every, nobody, anybody else that didn't do that, guess what happened? Literal judgment came to their house and people died. But not them. Pass them over. So they see all these mighty miracles of God. You would think then by the hand of God, when he miraculously brings them out of Egypt, what would they obviously normally in relationship to most people be doing? Oh God, we're so thankful. Thank you that you delivered us from this oppressor. We now get to go and get to know you again and walk with our God again. But lo and behold, they come up to the first challenge. And what do they do? Start complaining. Start moaning. Start groaning. Think of all the miracles they saw. I'm going to say it this way. They saw them, but they didn't see them. They saw what God did, but they didn't really see them. They didn't really see the heart of the, of the power of God behind what actually happened when they were in Egypt. Or well, they would certainly never question him. Never trusted him. I uh, never not trusted him. They would have trusted him. You certainly would have thought. But I'll guarantee you what, even though in the natural they saw that, they didn't really see it. Right. So look at this. In Psalm 78, referencing those very children of Israel, verse 40, 78 verse 40, notice how often they provoked him. Wow. Provoked here means rebelled against. Yeah. Simply to say it, they didn't trust him. Wow. They didn't trust him. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and they grieved him in the desert. Can I help you? If, if you have somebody that you truly dearly love and they know in their heart that they truly love you and they want to do everything they can in relationship to what they know to do to care for you or be good to you and you don't trust them, you know what that does to that individual's heart? It grieves them. Yeah. It grieves them. Yeah. Well, guess what? It grieves God. Yeah, of course they didn't trust God. Guess what it did to God? It grieved his heart. So he was it, it, it grieved, it grieved God in the desert, 41. Yes, again and again, they did what? Tempted God. Mm, now, tempt here just simply means they didn't trust God. And so they chose not to walk by faith and do what God required or asked of them so that they could walk in victory because they didn't trust him. Again and again, they tempted God, underline this please, and limited the Holy One of Israel. Wow. So what limits God in your life, a Christian? What limits God in your life? What's the heart? What's the heart behind what limits God in your life? What is the heart of it? Lack of trust. It's a lack of trust. This is why Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It pleases God when you trust Him, because now He's able to work on your behalf. He's able to do what He said. But it takes faith. He's a faith God. That's how He operates. How He works. So clearly for me and you, in the way that we would limit God, would be what? Same as them. Lack of trust. Lack of faith. They limited God's ability to bless them. They limited God's ability to help them. They limited God's ability to take them into the promise that he had. Think about that. And yet many Christians do it today. Why? Lack of faith. Lack of trust. What helps us to develop that trust? Gratitude. These people were not grateful for their God. They did not remember his power. Underline it. They did not remember his power. So see, they saw the things happen, but they didn't really see it. They didn't remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy. When he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of zone. Now, how in the world could you not remember all that God did? It says right there, they didn't remember him. They didn't remember him. Not like they just all of a sudden forgot who's God. Not like that meaning. Talking about they didn't remember by acknowledging. By acknowledging God. Can I tell you why? I'm going to tell you why they didn't remember him. Because guess who they were focused on? Themselves. They were focused on themselves. And every situation they came up to, Red Sea, it was all about that moment. And oh God, you're going to deliver us. And God did. And so all of a sudden, guess what? They got what they wanted for the moment. It was never about a relationship with God. For those, that first generation, it was never about relationship with God except for two. Right. Really three, Moses walked with God. But I'm talking about they went in the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. They had a different spirit about them. That's right. They wanted to know God. Not all those other people, they just didn't like being oppressed. Well, who does? Yeah. Right. 
They didn't like being in bondage. Who does? You found anybody that's been in bondage? They said, don't you just love being in bondage? Oh, I love it, man. I love being in bondage to pain and sickness and disease and suffering. No, nobody loves being in bondage. People want to get free, but the problem is they don't understand the one that will free them is the one that will keep them if they'll choose to simply focus on what he himself offers, a relationship with him. It wasn't about them. Excuse me, it wasn't about God. It was about them. It was about what they wanted. And if it's about what you want, then what you do is you come up against a problem. You start crying out to God. And if you have enough faith or belief in God, or God chooses to move on your behalf, and he actually delivers you, you're all excited for the moment. But it's still not about a relationship with God. It's still about what I want. And when the next situation comes along, here you are complaining, moaning, and groaning again. No trust in God. Why no trust in God? You don't know him. You don't know. It's not about relationship. It's about what God can do for me. In the day that you and I live in as a, as a whole, do you know what church has become? What can God do for me? Oh, he's already done everything. Everything that's ever needed to be done for you, he's already done it. That's not what it's about. It's not about what he can do for you. It's about the relationship he offers. In the midst of that relationship, he's going to take care of you. Because you're going to get to trust him. But that is developed through what? Gratitude. Drop down a little further into the same chapter. Let's drop down to verse 56. It goes on to say here, I don't have time to read all the verses. It goes on to say, Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God and did not keep His testimonies. Notice, they turned back. They turned back and acted unfaithfully. They acted like what? They acted what? Unfaith- what did they act? Unfaithfully like what? So if they were unfaithful, why were they unfaithful? Because they had no gratitude. It wasn't about God, it was about them. They acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger, and notice this, with their high places, other aspects of worship other than God, and they moved him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, how about the, how about the calf? When God heard this, he was furious, greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent he had placed among them, among men, and he delivered his strength, in, and he de- and delivered, excuse me, his strength into captivity, meaning what? He couldn't work on their behalf. Right. Why? They wouldn't trust him. They wouldn't trust him. And his glory into the enemy's hand, he also gave his people over to the sword and was furious with his inheritance. All that means he could not do for them what he wanted to do. Why? Because they didn't trust him they didn't trust him lack of gratitude lack of truly being grateful lack of what faith lack of faithfulness or being full of faith lack of faithfulness trust in God if you lack a trust in God what are you doing back to the very start of those verses you're limiting God you're limiting God ingratitude will cause you to limit God in your life Ingratitude will cause you to limit God in your life. Why? It'll affect your trust. It'll affect your faith in God. So how many think this gratitude thing might be pretty important? That's like three of you. I said, how many think this gratitude thing might be important? And to walk in gratitude, guess what you got to do? You got to deal with the daily moaning and groaning. doesn't mean you're moaning or groaning against God. In truth, a lot of those situations, they eventually did, but they weren't always moaning and groaning against God. They were just not happy about their situation. Right. We're tired of this manna. <laughs> the manna was probably better than Krispy Kreme could have ever dreamed of. Oh, but they were tired of it. You listening? Yes. Why? Because it was all about them. It was never about the relationship with God. It was about what they wanted for their life. And that what they wanted for their life was not relationship with God. Focus was not on him. But I'll tell you what, if your focus becomes on him, rooted and built up in him, and you develop a life of gratitude, guess what you're going to do? Abound in trust. Abound in faith. And it don't matter what situation you face or what comes up against you, guess what? It has no ability to overtake you because you know and trust your God. Reality of what we got to deal with, though, is how much of of our day goes to ingratitude because of stuff that's going on. So if I get ungrateful because, again, I'm in a long line, you know, we, we went through this like when we went to Pigeon Forge. We went to Pigeon Forge, of course, for the meetings we go to a pastor every year that he does just for ministers. And we went a little early to spend some extra time there. And the weekend we were there was Veterans Day weekend. And we ought to all be grateful for our veterans. Yeah, but you know what Pigeon Forge is full of on Veterans Day weekend? Not just veterans. It's a three-day weekend. If you wanted to get anywhere in Pigeon Forge fast, forget it. 
<laughs> Anybody ever been to Pigeon Forge? Hey, even though they got three lanes on each side of the street, man, I guarantee you what, on a weekend like that, you ain't going nowhere fast. You're going to sit in traffic. You're going to wait from light to light to light. You're not going to even get to light to light every time they turn green. You're going to have to wait a while to even get to the light. I'm serious, man. So you can get all upset about that stuff and say, man, this is frustrating. Sitting in traffic, I hate sitting in traffic. Where's your gratitude for the very fact you get to be there? Come on, somebody. Well, I'm tired of sitting in this traffic. You got to be grateful you got a vehicle to sit in the traffic with. Right? Yeah. In relationship to where we were, you're in the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful areas that you could be in, man. Look at the Smoky Mountains. But I'm just telling you, it's so easy. How many of you see this? It's so easy to get into ingratitude because of circumstances, things that happen. Well, that's what the children of Israel did. The less that we can be ingrateful in our life and start really cultivating gratitude and everything, the stronger your faith's going to become. Amen. Here's what it does. What gratitude does, it gets your eyes off of the problem. That's right. Amen. Abraham was not weak in faith because he didn't consider his body. Right. See, quit focusing on your problem. Amen. If you focus on your problem, you're going to be ungrateful. Mm-hmm. Gratitude gets your eyes off the problem. Right. And it gets your eyes on your God and it magnifies him. Lord. And your faith Amen. begins to abound. Yes, Lord. Could I get a better amen? amen? And it'll get you through whatever situation you're in or help you overcome it. Now, you can't overcome the traffic unless you can somehow turn your, heart, your car into a helicopter and fly over top of them. That ain't, but it'll get you through it. I said it'll get you through it. Yeah. Kathy can tell you in my past life, and I've worked on this, and I'm going to keep working on it. Man, every little thing used to bug me. Every little situation. Man, I'm, I'm like, you know, in, in my days in the past, I'm 100 miles an hour plus trying to get somewhere to go somewhere to do something to do this do that whatever and it's like i got to be there yesterday kind of thing you know and i'll tell you what if you live with that kind of attitude you're going to lose sight of god you're going to get totally ungrateful for what god has given you relationship with him it's going to hinder your faith walk with god and it's going to cause you to be more focused on your circumstances than anything else you practice that on a daily basis allowing stuff to focus excuse me allowing stuff to get your focus on it through ingratitude what's going to happen then when you're faced with a battle or challenge you're going to do the same thing because that's what you that's what you become accustomed to but what have you become accustomed to focusing on god and we're going to show you tonight some simple little things that can help you to develop this life of gratitude and if you really truly get grateful guess what's going to happen your faith is going to abound Thus saith Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. Amen. We pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.